As you can see from the board, we, we're going to talk about a title that may be a little bit uh, perplexing maybe um, as you look first look at it, but uh, I've entitled it The Stranger, The Scoundrel, and The Soldier. And these are three particular encounters that take place at the cross, and you may be you may know exactly who three, uh, the three individuals I'm referring to. It, you know, you may know one or two. Uh, so these were three things that I, I studied, three individuals that I studied. And as I began to study these, these people, uh, these men, I um, just gained a greater appreciation for Jesus Christ as I reflected upon their interactions with him. Uh, I was just, uh, you know, intrigued by their examples, intrigued by their stories. Uh, and greatly encouraged, and so I hope that I can impart that to you this morning as we reflect upon uh, these three stories. And to help set the stage, I want to read some scripture from Luke's gospel, uh, and this will help lead into these three stories. So in Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 25, we read, Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed having examined him in your presence... I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accused him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent, I sent you back to him. Another translation of that is he sent him back to us. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and, the, and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. So here we see as we lead into this story, uh, we're about to talk about the individual that I've labeled as the stranger. But what's led up to this, of course, is Jesus has been uh, tried. He's been challenged by the Jews, the Jewish leaders. Uh, he's been brought before Pilate. Uh, the Jews say that he needs to be condemned to death. Pilate tries to appease them. He tries to tell them this man's done nothing wrong. He's not done anything deserving of death. Uh, I find no reason for death in him. But they, the uh, rulers of the Jews, the elders, the, the uh, chief priests, they encourage the people to shout for Jesus to be crucified. Uh, and we see that Pilate ends up giving in to their demands. But then we see an individual come on the scene. Uh, and I think what's left out of this account is the uh, brutal scourging that Jesus goes through. Uh, and this was the, uh, the Roman rule that an individual who was condemned in this way had to be scourged, and they were scourged. And we've heard other uh, individuals give details of that from the pulpit. We've uh, certainly seen it depicted in, in movies like The Passion of the Christ that was, came out back in 2004. Uh, but when we think about that brutal event that Jesus undergoes, that scourging, um, it, was, uh, it was to be 40 stripes minus one that the Jewish law prevented it from going beyond or going up to 40 um, uh, or beyond 40 stripes. So Jesus undergoes this scourging, uh, this brutal mutilation uh, of this cat of nine tails, as it's called, this, uh, this leather that is uh, intertwined with sharp objects, glass, uh, things that are meant to uh, cause devastation. Uh, and he, he takes uh, hit after hit from this instrument. Uh, and we see gradually his flesh is ripped away from his body. Uh, he is, he is uh, broken. He is, he is bleeding. Uh, he is beaten uh, to a bloody pulp. Uh, and then that uh, is what Jesus undergoes. And, and unfortunately, even the, uh, the accounts that do refer to this, it's usually just one sentence. And after he had scourged him, he delivered him to be crucified. That little phrase, after he had scourged him, doesn't tell us the full story of what that brutal event entails. But as Jesus comes out of that, um, and we see that he is also mocked by the soldiers as well, but as he's coming out of that, and he's, he's, uh, he's, he's bloodied, he's beaten, he's brought out and made to carry his own cross. Those that endure crucifixion, that's one final um, bit of shame that they have to go through uh, 
uh, and, and irony is that they have to carry the instrument that they are about to be crucified on. So Jesus is made to carry His own cross. And in Luke 23, verse 26, we read, Now as they led Him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So what's taking place here is Jesus uh, being so mutilated as he is, he's, he's exhausted, he's, he's to the point that he just can't, can't go on. Uh, and the Roman soldiers see this, and so they, they then reach out to one individual in the crowd, this man named Simon a Cyrenian. And we also see the uh, parallel accounts there in Matthew 27, 32, and Mark 15 and 21. Scripture doesn't reveal to us very much about this man. Uh, We know his name is Simon, of course, which is a Jewish name. Uh, And we see that he comes from the country of Cyrene. And this is a Greek settlement that uh, is on the northern African coast. It's what present day would be uh, the town of Tripoli, the city of Tripoli in modern day Libya. And I wanted to give a presentation of this to see where this falls and to see where this man has journeyed from. You know, as we read over it, it's not knowing the context of it. It's easy for us to just kind of read over that, that detail. But this was a significant uh, travel for this individual. It was about 780 miles from Cyrene to Jerusalem. Uh, and most likely he traveled by boat to get there. Uh, Cyrene was only about 10 miles from the coast. Uh, so likely he traveled to the coast, took a boat uh, to uh, make his way most of the journey to Jerusalem. Uh, The population around that time, there's varying statistics, but the population of Cyrene, it was no small city. Uh, It had a population of around 100,000 people. So he comes from a pretty good size uh, city and Jews made up a good chunk of that population. And so we see exactly just how far he's traveled. And we can only speculate. uh, There's there's very little that's revealed about him, but uh, uh, we do see that he's the father of, of Alexander and Rufus. We see that referred to in Mark chapter 15, verse 21. So he is a father. Uh, that gives us another glimpse into a little bit of his character and, and uh, his, uh, uh, his background. And we'll touch on that here in a little bit as well. Uh, as I mentioned, he was likely a Jew. And if a Jew, then likely he's at the Passover like many other Jews uh, traveling there um, at the time of the Passover. Um, and so there were, by some accounts, there were around a million people there in Jerusalem to observe the Passover feast. And so this could have been the very reason that Simon had traveled here. Uh, and we see that he came from the countryside, Luke 23 and 26. So um, a, a couple of things I do want to mention about Simon of Cyrene. Uh, he's, a, he's a character that definitely uh, is of great interest to people. Uh, on average, the keywords Simon of Cyrene have accumulated search volumes of about 48,000 searches per month uh, on the internet. Uh, and also Simon of Cyrene is being searched for by people all over the world. I think this is interesting. Currently, the, these searches come mostly from Zimbabwe, Uganda, and Kenya. Uh, and so we just see that he's a character of great interest. And we saw a huge spike uh, in that, according to one source, we saw a huge spike in the searches for Simon of Cyrene back in 2004. That's when Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, came out. So there's a high level of interest uh, into Simon of Cyrene. But I want to point out here that we see that he came from the countryside. So just imagine this scene as it unfolds. We see that Jesus, again, after he's endured the pain of the, of the, uh, of the scourging, he then is made to carry his own cross. Um, you know, we see this depicted in other ways in films, but we see that he... he uh, uh, you know, is is burdened under the weight of this cross. Uh, And we see that Simon arrives on the scene. Perhaps he's just passing through. The phrase coming from the countryside implies that he's just a guy that just just happens to be uh, in that place. There's no evidence that he observed the the scourging of Jesus. Uh, It just seems like he just arrived on the scene and sees Jesus struggling to carry the cross. The Roman soldiers notice Simon in the crowd. And they say, you, come over here. You're going to help him carry this cross. Now just imagine if you're in Simon's shoes and you've just witnessed this scene unfold and you see this person, this public spectacle as what's been made out of Jesus. You see people in the crowd looking on. Nobody rushing to his aid. Um, and you just see that he's just standing there perhaps just as, just as you know, perplexed as anybody in the crowd. But for some reason, the Roman soldiers pick him out of the crowd and and they say you're the one that's going to be uh, carrying the cross and 
Uh, I went back and looked at this scene in the Passion of the Christ, and of course we're just left to interpret some of these details in between what the Bible reveals, but the, the look on Simon's face is the look that we probably all would have. He kind of looked and said, are you, are you talking to me? You want, you want me to help carry this cross? You know, I think he wanted nothing to do with this. He certainly didn't volunteer uh, to offer this help and this service to Jesus. But we see that he's pulled out of the crowd and uh, reluctantly, uh, perhaps he's leaving his family behind and, telling, and, and ob ob obliging the uh, request, pretty much the demands of the Roman soldiers to come along and help Jesus carry the cross. As I mentioned, this was just one additional humiliation that the convicted person had to, uh, or, or the, uh, the accused. Jesus, of course, was, was blameless and perfect, but this is one thing that the accused and those destined to be crucified, they had to carry their own cross. The weight of the cross, you'll see varying uh, statistics on uh, exactly how much it weighed. It's anywhere from 200 to 300 pounds is what I saw uh, online, different sources. There's some speculation about did Jesus carry just the cross beam of the cross or did he carry the entire cross? And even the cross beam, some say, was about 70 to 90 pounds. So still no small uh, weight to carry uh, for even a healthy person, much less someone who has just been beaten to almost the point of death. Um, and so we see this, this tremendous weight of the cross that Jesus has been made to endure. Simon arrives to, uh, uh, to help him, uh, or he's been called out from the crowd to help him. And just pointing out some of the things that Jesus has endured. Obviously, he's endured significant blood loss. Uh, he's dehydrated. Uh, he's in excruciating pain. The crown of thorns is still pressed deeply into his scalp. Um, you know, the, the open wounds that he's endured from the scourging. Uh, he's been brought almost to the point of death, as I mentioned. And ultimately, he's just exhausted. He has very little energy to just keep going on. Uh, and so we see that uh, he needs some additional help. Perhaps it's the uh, soldiers and their impatience of just trying to get this event uh, going on. They see that Jesus isn't going to be able to complete the job. And maybe it's their impatience that causes them to pull Simon from the crowd. And I think it's interesting that there's that there's no one around and we you know we hear this we sing this in songs Jesus stood without a friend um, you know when we think about Simon a complete stranger that's why I've labeled him the stranger um, and also just a, a traveler just happening to be passing through but the fact that none of his disciples were around to help him carry this cross the ones who've traveled with him through various towns they've seen all of his teachings all of his miracles uh, they've witnessed who he truly is and they've been the beneficiaries of of his love and they've shown their respect to him on his, on countless journeys but his disciples were nowhere to be found and i don't say that to condemn them because very likely i would be in the same predicament i would like to think i would choose differently but i know that the challenges they faced i would be facing the same challenges uh, would i have been there for jesus that's a question you know certainly we would we would all do well to ponder but where were Jesus' disciples at this time that it took a complete stranger to help him bear, uh, bear this burden? But Simon seems to have just arrived on the scene. He wasn't, uh, as I mentioned, he wasn't present for the scourging. And so he's just completely, it seems, as we're left to interpret, he seems completely bewildered uh, by being asked to do this. Um, you know, we can only imagine how that scene unfolds. As I mentioned, you know, we see different depictions of it. But just imagine if you're in the shoes of Simon the Cyrenian at this time, and you're standing next to Jesus, you're underneath the cross with him, helping bear this burden. Just imagine if Jesus made eye contact with you at that time. You see his bloodied and bruised and battered face just looking up at you, and you're the one walking alongside him at this time in some of his final moments. To me, that's just a, a very impactful um, situation to be in. <clears throat> Uh, to be witnessing uh, something as gruesome as that. And perhaps Simon has never had any interaction with Jesus previously. Perhaps he's never heard any of his teachings. We really don't know fully his background. But imagine if he just arrives on the scene and just, you know, this is his first interaction with Jesus. You know, what would you be thinking and what would you be feeling at this time? But we see that he helps bear the cross of Jesus. First of all, we see that he helps bear, bear the burden. As I mentioned, it's a heavy weight that he's, he's made to carry. And we don't know how far Jesus has carried the cross to this point, how much is left to go. We're just left to speculate. Uh, I've seen anywhere from uh, 400 to 1,000 yards is, where, is the total distance of where they may have had to go 
uh, for the crucifixion scene. So anywhere from four to 10 football fields in length uh, for a two to 300 pound potential uh, burden to carry. So just putting that all in perspective. But also he's bearing the shame. Obviously he's not bearing the shame of what Jesus is having to go through, but in his proximity to Jesus at that time, the crowd's looking on at Jesus. A lot of them are throwing uh, insults at him. Uh, they're, they're jeering at him. They're condemning him. And Simon's just right there next to him. And it, you know, you kind of get that guilty by proximity, uh, guilty by association. But he's bearing the shame as well. He's in the spotlight as they're making their way on this death march to Calvary. And we also see that he's bearing the sorrow. As I mentioned, he may not have never even known who Jesus was before this point. But we see that he has, we would have to imagine, has compassion on Jesus uh, as he's seeing what he's undergone and seeing what else is, uh, he's destined to undergo. And I like what Jimmy Cading says in his commentary in Luke. <clears throat> he says, while Simon is compelled by the soldiers to pick up the cross, love compels him to never put it down. Just think about that for a moment. This, the impact that this event had on Simon the Cyrenian, the fact that he, um, he didn't volunteer for this service, he didn't ask for this, he didn't ask to be here. Perhaps it was just a happenstance that he happened to be passing that particular street, going on about his way. But the fact that this, this, the impact of this event and what it does uh, for him, it's an event that certainly he will never forget for the rest of his life. Brother Cading also points out, there is strong evidence to suggest this close interaction with Jesus converts Simon to Christ. Now I want to point out that Scripture doesn't reveal that to us, so I want to be clear that, that we're not spreading something the Bible doesn't indicate. But there are other historical records, there are other sources that these individuals, uh, like Cading is referencing, doesn't seem to indicate that Simon, uh, this individual, does come to Christ. A little bit more evidence of that is we see that Simon's the father of Alexander and Rufus, as I mentioned previously. These two sons, uh, Mark specifically points out. Now Mark wrote his gospel while he was in Rome. Uh, so he wrote to a Roman audience primarily. And these individuals would have been known to the Roman congregation there. And so he mentions them by name, Alexander and Rufus. And so... Perhaps these sons have been active in the church there. Perhaps they've been active members in the congregation there. They're individuals that people are going to recognize by name. Also, this Simon of Cyrene is potentially the same Simon that Paul greets in Romans chapter 16, verse 13. And so it is possible there's evidence to support that Simon possibly moves his family to the city of Rome. So we see the, the profound impact that perhaps this event setting the stage for Simon's life and the, fam his, the family as well, uh, the impact that it has on their future. And so as we reflect upon this first character, the stranger, you know, we all come to Christ as strangers. You know, we all come from different backgrounds. Some of us are raised in the church. Some of us find uh, the gospel. Some of us hear the gospel at a later point in life, we all come from different backgrounds, um, but we all come essentially as strangers, never having known him uh, until we finally gain an understanding of who he is and a greater appreciation for who he is. We should all bear the cross after Jesus. You know, the song that's in our song books, uh, must Jesus bear the cross alone? You know, we all need to recognize that it's important to follow Simon's example. He did it in a... In a uh, a literal sense, but we in a figurative sense, we must bear the cross after Jesus as well. We must take up the mantle uh, and, and be spreading the gospel message and ask ourselves the question, must he bear the cross alone? And also it points out that the cost of discipleship is very high. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We all need to put aside the things, the cares of this life. And just as Simon had to do in this moment, um, everything he put his family aside. He, he had to focus solely on this event. And it's a, a obviously a literal representation of what we do uh, in, in a figurative sense as Christians uh, to make Jesus our priority and being disciples of Him. And also, if we fully commit to Christ, our lives will never be the same, or at least they shouldn't be the same. And that goes to the, uh, the understanding of 
fully commit. We need to recognize what that means to be all in, as Brother John has mentioned in a previous lesson. Fully commit to Christ. And for certain, our lives and perhaps the lives of our families will be forever changed. So we leave the character of the stranger, Simon of Cyrene, and we proceed on. We pick up our reading in Mark chapter 15, verses 22 through 28. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him sour wine. They gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him and the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And so the next character that I want to mention here is what I refer to as the scoundrel. And you probably know which, which thief on the cross we're referring to. Um, but I want to point out another passage as we continue on in Mark chapter 15. There in, 20, in verse 29, we, we pick up there, And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that so we may see and believe. And then we see there, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. So we see initially from Matthew's gospel, from Mark's account as well, that both robbers initially reviled Jesus. They both initially are hurling the same insults at Jesus that the crowd is. They blame Jesus potentially for uh, expediting their own deaths. You know, it could have been that maybe they had a little bit longer on death row, so to speak. Uh, but we see that things are expedited for them perhaps, uh, and they're blaming Jesus. They're, uh, they're uh, hurling these insults at Him. And one we see continues to mock Jesus. Uh, as Brother Cading points out, unfortunately for this criminal on the cross, he rejects the true salvation that is within his reach. We see one individual, both individuals start off uh, rebuking Jesus, reviling Him, uh, but we see that one continues in that same pattern but we see that one ends up having a change of heart, and it's sad for the other that he doesn't have that same change of heart. But uh, reading on there in verse 39, we read of the change of heart. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now make no mistake, what we see here in verse 39, that's, that's certainly an insult to Jesus. He's not saying, well, I trust in you. You can save us. This, this is an insult to Jesus. He's basically saying, well, if you are who you say you are, why don't you just go ahead and save yourself and us? Um, and the other we see in verse 40 rebukes that man uh, and he himself has the change of heart. He realizes the state that he's in. He's what's known as the penitent thief. Now we don't know as they're hanging on the cross, of obviously Jesus is in the center. Both of these thieves are crucified on each side of Him. We don't know which one is hanging on the right or the left uh, of Jesus. But a lot of sources tend to lean toward the individual who was the penitent thief, the one who wanted to change his ways and seek forgiveness, was the individual on the right of Jesus. Uh, so I just think about that in, in picturing this scene. But this penitent thief, he even goes so far as to rebuke the other thief. He tries to get him to change his heart also and to fear God. Now, we don't know fully, uh, you know, as we, as, we, as we see with the stranger, Simon of Cyrene, uh, this individual as well, we have to kind of read between the lines a little bit. But there's, there's definitely an allusion to the fact that maybe these two individuals knew each other, these two thieves, and perhaps they were partners in crime. Um, but we see that this individual tries to connect with the other as they're both hanging just moments from death, saying, hey, you need to take inventory of your life because you know, we're both, both in, a, in a lost state. And he tries to let him know, hey, this, this guy, he's, he's not guilty of anything. We see this individual, he looks inwardly. He's convicted. We see that he, he reflects upon his past life. He, again, he's only moments from death. And he knows that he's only moments away from oblivion, so to speak. Um, he doesn't know what lies ahead of him, but he knows uh, and is convicted that he, 
He's in a, in a wrong state. He contrasts his life to Jesus. We see that made evident there. He says, I, we, we deserve what we're getting, but this guy's done nothing wrong. He's absolutely blameless. He's perfect. He doesn't, he's not deserving of being here with us. Us low lives, us scoundrels. But he asked Jesus to save him. You know, and I think that's a, just a very touching scene. And <clears throat> Luke's account is one of my favorite accounts in reading about the crucifixion of Jesus because of this moment. And we read it here in Luke 23, verses 42 and 43. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. <clears throat> So here we see that the penitent thief, he calls Jesus Lord. He recognizes Jesus' authority and his superiority. He's appealing to Jesus. He's humbling himself before Jesus. He asks Jesus to remember him. And you know, he, he takes the moment to just say, I know you're about, to, you're about to pass into your kingdom. I just want you to please remember me. It's a humble request. And he believes that Jesus will receive a kingdom. Now, we don't know how this thief, this scoundrel, this low life as far as society is concerned, we don't know how he found out about Jesus' kingdom. We don't know how he came to a knowledge of that. We don't know if he previously was a disciple of Jesus and then went to, back to a life of crime. Uh, we don't know if he happened to have heard some of the teachings of Jesus, if he saw some of the miracles completed by Jesus. We simply don't know, but somehow he has uh, the he has the understanding that Jesus is going to uh, enter into a kingdom and he knows it's not going to be of this world because Jesus is about to pass from this life. So we see that he has confidence in Jesus and he asks Jesus to remember him. In Jesus, we see his, his immortal response there, today you'll be with me in paradise. And I can only imagine this man, uh, this, this scoundrel, this, this thief as he's hanging on the cross, realizing he can't save himself. Realizing he's Again, just seconds away from breathing his last breath and knowing destruction is headed his way, he knows that he, he, his only source of salvation and hope is Jesus who's hanging next to him. And I can only imagine the, the overwhelming feeling of relief that comes over him as Jesus says, I'm going to remember you when I come into my kingdom. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And just to think about if we were in that same situation, to think about the comfort that would, you know, cover us, <clears throat> cover us like a blanket to recognize that we're going to be okay. In this paradise, we don't know exactly what it's referring to. It could be the intermediate place in the Hadean realm where the righteous go to await judgment. It could actually be referring to heaven. It could be synonymous with heaven. We don't know, but we know it's going to be obviously a good place, a desirable place for this man to go. So some lessons from this individual, he was willing to go against the chance of the crowd and the other criminal. This person who may have been a colleague, a partner in crime, so to speak, he doesn't join in. He realizes, wait a minute, we're, something's got to change here because this, uh, I'm, I'm in a lost state, you're in a lost state. The, the crowd continues to hurl insults at Jesus even as he's hanging on the cross. Uh, he's enduring tremendous shame. This individual decides to go against the grain so to speak, and he decides instead, I'm going to seek uh, forgiveness for myself. And we all must compare ourselves to Jesus, just as this man did. He basically put his life against Jesus. He said, I deserve to be here. He doesn't. I deserve destruction. He's done nothing wrong. He's blameless. And that's something we all must do. We all must look at and open up the book of God and recognize that we need to be comparing our lives as a yardstick to the perfect life of Jesus, to his teachings, and constantly be reflecting upon um, how we stack up against uh, his perfect example and make sure we're, we're trying to progress as best we can uh, in faithfulness to him. I think another fact that stands out, obviously, is no one is beyond saving. I know I'm pointing out some of the obvious here, but they're very profound statements or very profound points from this story to me. That no matter what our background is, no matter how long we've lived in sin, I'm not advocating that anybody should seek after an 11th hour, um, uh, 11th hour confession. We, we don't need to be waiting until the end of our life to make our lives right. But if we find ourselves today in a situation where we need to make things right, 
there's never a better time than now and no one's beyond the point of being saved and being brought into a right relationship with God. And I think that this, this, this points it out more clearly perhaps than, than maybe any other example has for me. That no one is beyond saving. Continuing on in Mark's account, as we leave uh, this image of the thief behind, uh, we see uh, these events uh, continue to transpire. Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 38. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. If you remember our title slide, the third and final character we're going to be noticing this morning is the soldier. There's an individual who's looking on and seeing these events transpire. But as we think about the soldier, the Roman soldiers at this time, there were a number of soldiers that Jesus came into contact with during his final moments. We have the Roman scourger, as we've already mentioned, uh, this individual that inflicts uh, this gruesome punishment upon Jesus. There's the soldiers in the praetorium who put this uh, uh, robe on him, the crown of thorns, uh, the reed in his hand. They do it in an effort to mock him, uh, to make a spectacle of him. There are those who usher Jesus toward Calvary. Those are the same ones that pull Simon from the crowd. Those who cast lots for his clothing. Uh, they essentially are beneath the cross playing a game, casting lots, seeing who is going to be able to obtain the garments of Jesus as he's hanging there dying. There's obviously the one who nails him to the cross. Imagine being the individual who actually nails the nails through his hands uh, during his, his final moments. The one who offers him the sour wine. Some speculate that may have actually been a, a moment of compassion for Jesus. Some say it was probably a last minute insult to him. We don't know, but that's just another soldier that comes into contact with Jesus. And then there's the one who drives the spear at his side. And perhaps some of these are the same soldiers kind of coming in and out of focus uh, through these last moments. But he comes into contact with a number of these soldiers. But there's one in, in particular that I want to highlight. The one that stands out above the rest. And that's in Mark chapter 15, verse 39. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. So here we've got a centurion. And as the name implies, this was an individual who uh, was over a hundred soldiers. He had a hundred soldiers, a hundred men at his command. So as we reflect upon some things that we know about centurions, not necessarily this one in particular, but things that we know about centurions, obviously they're very battle hardened. Uh, they've been conquerors over various territories, endured numerous battles. Uh, they've seen the worst of it. Uh, they've seen some gruesome scenes. And uh, no doubt this is just perhaps just another uh, execution that this man has witnessed uh, in the multitude of ones that he's witnessed in the past. We also imagine them, I think, as very stoic. Uh, these are individuals that are basically an extension of the Roman Empire. And they are, their goal is to, their job is to uh, enact and enforce uh, the Roman rule wherever they proceed through. So we just imagine them just basically being very stoic, very... Um, you know, very forward moving. Uh, nothing we think really slows them down. They just press forward and advance uh, in whatever they're doing. We also see that they're of good character. And Carl Johnson points this out in his commentary uh, over the Gospel of Matthew. He says that Plummer, uh, the um, commentator, makes the interesting observation that the New Testament often mentions the good character of Roman centurions. The Roman organization produced and promoted men of fine character. So this wasn't just some random soldier uh, that just happened to be elevated to a position. He had to be of good moral character. He had to be of good character, uh, a, a good work ethic. He had to be a good and noble man uh, to be able to be elevated to such a position. And then we see also that he likely oversaw many executions during his time. So when we think about what this soldier, what this centurion may have witnessed, what he did witness, uh, there were some supernatural events that the Bible mentions. 
we see that the sky turns black. And what's astounding about this is that it's in the middle of the day. It's, it's the noon hour and the sky turns black. And this certainly would capture everybody's attention um, as they see this, this event unfold. And the sky is black for three hours. It's all the way until three in the evening uh, that we see that, that the world is darkened, or at least this, this portion of the world is darkened. Uh, we also see earthquakes take place. And we also see that it's a bewildering execution. As I mentioned, he's witnessed many before, but there's something far different about this one. He notices that the man on the cross doesn't hurl any cursing toward those that are executing him. Instead, he's pleading for their forgiveness. There's no screams of anguish. And as Isaiah points out in, in Isaiah 53, that as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. We see that Jesus proceeds through these final moments of his life. He's, he's very quiet. He's very humble uh, throughout these moments. Jesus begs God to forgive his executioners. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Certainly this is bewildering to the centurion. He also witnesses Jesus blessing the thief while he's hanging on the cross. Why would anybody who's enduring this to be even thinking about anybody else other than himself at that point? But he also witnesses Jesus uh, looking out for his own mother, telling John, the disciple whom he loved, to look after his mother after he passes. And he also witnesses, and this is what's astounding, is that he dies in full control of his faculties. Now, individuals who've endured what Jesus has, uh, certainly they would just almost be uh, at a point that they couldn't even communicate, uh, much less be able to be thinking clearly and recognizing and being able to speak these clear sentences and uh, to be blessing these individuals and asking for forgiveness. So this astounds the centurion. This stands out above all the other executions he's witnessed. This individual dies in full control of his physical faculties and his mental faculties. Um, and his final words are to commit his spirit to God. And then not only that, but we see that he cries out with a loud voice. Now individuals who have been crucified, they're hanging on the cross and they're, they're suffocating to death. Uh, they, they don't have the ability to breathe, much less speak. But not only does Jesus speak, not only is he... Uh, you know, just moments away from dying and any individual in that state shouldn't even be able to breathe, much less uh, speak. But he cries out with a loud voice. And this certainly, as you think about it and picture it in the darkness of, of the surroundings, and you think about the earth quaking and you hear this individual cry out with a loud voice and breathe his final breath, this had a profound impact on this centurion. And he, he even goes so far as to say, truly this was the Son of God. This man of war, this man who um, perhaps had never even known religion, sees these events unfold and he comes to the conclusion that only, on, the only conclusion that anyone could come to in that moment and that this, this was a righteous person. And in one account we see that tr he says truly this was not only a righteous person, but this was the Son of God. And so we see in Luke, 20, Luke 23, verse 47 as well, so when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying certainly this was a righteous man. The fact that he gives glory to God uh, in witnessing this and in his statement concluding Jesus' death, uh, I think is, is uh, very profound for us uh, to, uh, to observe as well. So as we reflect upon this soldier, um, again, uh, scripture doesn't reveal this to us, but there are commentators who say that uh, history or tradition holds that the centurion's name is Longinus and he comes to faith beneath the dead Savior's cross. Now take that for what it is. Again, it's not recorded in Scripture, so I think we have to, uh, have to recognize that, put it where it is. But if, if there are different historical accounts that Linsky is leaning on to come to that conclusion, I think it does have some credibility. But as we think about this event, whether he does come to Christ or not, this event is something that he's going to be forever changed by. He's not going to be able to forget this or get this image uh, out of his mind. Talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. This was something that he, he had endured uh, numerous uh, violent events, but this was one, uh, this was one tragic event that what, uh, rose to the top for him. So lessons we can remember from the soldier, from this centurion, this was a conqueror who became conquered himself. This moment, remember, he's got 100 men under his charge. He's got to maintain his composure, but this is a moment he can't maintain his composure. Uh, he, he essentially just, just 
speaks out what's on his mind uh, and, and says this is truly the Son of God. And of course, he's got uh, other soldiers at his charge that are witnessing uh, his admission. When confronted with the evidence of Jesus' deity, there was no denial or resistance on the part of the centurion. And I think for us today, obviously we don't see Jesus face to face like these individuals that we've looked at this morning. But we, we can take confidence in the fact that these were eyewitnesses to Jesus' final moments and to recognize the, the value in looking at um, what they witnessed, looking at it through their eyes. And, he, and we recognize what this individual, uh, the conclusion he came to. And we also see that the word, uh, if what Linsky uh, found in, in records is true, the word found fertile ground in the centurion's heart. And when we think about the seed, uh, the parable of the sower, the seed that fell on good ground, this seemed to be seed that was sown on good ground. Um, Jesus, we don't really think about it, or at least I haven't thought about it, essentially was preaching a sermon as He's hanging on the cross. He's, people are still looking on. They're still observing what He's saying um, and, and what, how He's acting. Uh, and we see that it has an impact on this individual. Just as it has for all three of these men. These were, as we draw our lesson to a close, these were three men who crossed paths with Jesus during His final moments on earth. Uh, they came from different backgrounds. One was a traveler simply passing through. He was far from home. One was a low-life thief. And of course, the other was what seemed to be an upstanding centurion and soldier in the Roman Empire. Uh, different backgrounds. But their encounters with Jesus had a profound and lasting impact on them. And there's certainly many other points that we could draw from this. You might be thinking of some as you're sitting here reflecting on these characters. But uh, this was a lesson that uh, that deeply resonated with me, and I hope it's been a benefit to you this morning. We never want to uh, close the service without extending the invitation. If there's one here who has never obeyed the gospel, this invitation is for you. As we reflect again on the thief on the cross, um, you know there are many who like to point out, just as a side note, that you know that means that baptism is not essential for salvation. If the thief on the cross can can be saved, then we don't need to be baptized. But uh, uh, several brothers have pointed out the, uh, the, the uh, faulty uh, logic behind that. Um, we've got a uh, podcast episode actually on our Chapel Grove uh, um, podcast, episode number six, I believe it is, Etienne Talks to Marcus Reppert. Uh, great conversation there. I highly recommend you check that out um, where Marcus pretty much refutes uh, any, any response to being able to say that baptism is not essential for salvation when especially when you try to use the thief on the cross as an example. But as we reflect upon the thief on the cross, and what we see is that he comes to the conclusion that, as I mentioned, he's destined for eternal destruction, and he knows that Jesus is his own and only source of salvation. And this morning, if you're in a similar situation, if you've never obeyed the gospel, if you know that destruction is certain, and if Jesus were to come back today, or if today were your last day on earth, where would you spend eternity? And that's something we all need to reflect upon. And if you, need to make, if you need to make your life right with God, if you need to obey the gospel, we encourage you to do that at this time. You must hear His word, believe it, repent of your sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Uh, but if you are a Christian, but if you've committed some wrong of a public nature, you need to make something right, we're here for you as well. Please come as we stand and sing. We really appreciate you watching this channel and supporting the Chapel Grove Church of Christ YouTube page. I want to ask you a quick question. Do you want to help in a big way spread the gospel and help this channel succeed? All you have to do is click the subscribe button, click a thumbs up, and then share it with a friend. Share it on social media, share it on text. However you do it, just share it for other people to see. It helps the channel grow, it helps the videos get out there, and it helps spread the gospel in a really easy way that has a big effect. Thank you for supporting us and come back for more videos.